The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, mass market paperbacks, and we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirod. Today, we bring you DJ Butler's conversation with Simon R. Green about his new Ishmael Jones novel, Dead Man Walking. But first, the news. It's February and the mass market paperbacks have hit bookstore shelves. Let's take a look. First up, Stolen Skies by Tim Powers. Aliens seem to be invading Los Angeles, but to what purpose? Former federal agent Sebastian Vickery has learned something about UFOs that he shouldn't have, and Naval Intelligence orders his old partner, Agent Ingrid Castine, to trap him. But Castine risks her life to warn Vickery, and now they're both fugitives, on the run from both the U.S. government and agents of the Russian GRU Directorate. Next up, we have Harbinger by Wynne Spencer. The war against the Oni heats to a flashpoint, even as Tinker learns that the enemy has a dangerous new weapon, the Nakta. What's more, the Stone Clan has sent its most famous warlords, the Harbingers, to take control of the Allied war effort. Team Mischief, go! And finally, we have The Deep Man by Michael Merceau. The galactic imperium of the myriad worlds slumps into centuries of decadent peace, enabled by a flood of advanced technology from the mysterious non-human shapers. Now, one man must complete his mission to restore the greatness of his family and uncover the chilling plot to extinguish humanity's light from the galaxy. That's Stolen Skies, Harbinger, and The Deep Man, all available now in mass market paperback. And that's it for the news. All right, welcome to the uh, Bain Free Radio Hour. This is your host, uh, DJ Dave Butler. I'm here with... Uh, with Simon R. Green, uh, whose uh, novel Dead Man Walking uh, is being uh, printed in the U.S. in trade paperback uh, by, uh, by Bain Books. Uh, Simon is the author of the best-selling Death Stalker Cycle, the New York Times bestseller Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and many other novels. He lives in Bradford-upon-Avon, Wilshire. Uh, he's a veteran of of over, over 30 years in the business, uh, multiple novels and uh, screenplays to his credit, actually. Simon, uh, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Hey, um, so I would love to discuss a little bit, of, just for some context, uh, the, the publication history of the Ishmael Jones uh, stories. Uh, because we are, uh, I believe this is correct, we're making them uh, available, we're publishing them in the U.S. for the first time, but they've been published elsewhere for a few years now, is that right? Yeah, they started out um, with the British publisher Seven House. I had an idea for an Agatha Christie-style murder mystery with science fiction and fantasy elements, and it went around and nobody wanted it, and finally seven said yes we like it so they took it and i thought well that's it it's a one-off fine and then seven came back and said actually this sold rather well can we have two more i said oh i hadn't planned to but okay fine i ended up writing about a dozen of the things um ishmael jones is a different kind of detective if i can give you the background on the character yes lovely in 1963, a star fell from the heavens and landed in an English field. Or to put it another way, an alien starship came screaming in from the outer dark with its superstructure on fire and crashed in an English field. The impact killed all of the alien crew except one. This lone survivor had to be rewritten by the ship's transformation machines 
to make him completely human, right down to his DNA, so he could survive on our world until help came. Unfortunately, the transformation machine was damaged in the crash, and it wiped all memory of who this human being was before he was human. This is our hero, Ishmael Jones. He knows vaguely that he started out as an alien, but he has no memory of who or what or where he came from. He doesn't even remember where his ship crashed. He might think it's all some kind of illusion, but he hasn't aged a day since 1963. Down the years, he's worked for all kinds of um, underground organizations, because they're the only people who can basically hide him from an increasingly curious world. And because he is human but wasn't raised as human, he's the outsider. He sees us from outside. So when he goes into a mystery, he's able to see things that other people would miss. And that was the background of the first book. This character plunged into an Agatha Christie murder mystery and helps to deal what turns out to be a very strange and involved murder. And this is where he meets a lot of his life, Penny Belcourt. So when I came to do the second book, which is Dead Man Walking, I thought, right, how are we going to, to, to build on this character and get a series going? And I thought, well, if the first one is Agatha Christie murder mystery, I want a different kind of mystery for the second book. And I thought, well, Ishmael really is a kind of secret agent. He works for underground organizations dealing in weird stuff. Let's plunge him into the world of spies and secret agents and so on. So Ishmael works for the organization, which is so mysterious, even he doesn't know who and what he's working for. They protect him from the world, and he takes on whatever cases they send him on. Essentially, one of the great and most successful British spies, think of James Bond, essentially leaving MI5 and going to work for Spectre. After so many years, he's now saying, I want to come in from the cold, I want to come back to, to my homeland, and I will tell you every single secret of everything I've done, everyone I've worked with. And I'll also name a few well-established spies inside your own organization. So, of course, they smuggle him off to an interrogation center. But they got all kinds of threats. People want him dead before he can give up his secrets. So Ishmael and Penny are brought in to keep this guy alive during his interrogation. So they go to the center, and of course, the guy is killed within 12 hours. Now, how is this possible inside the, the most secure interrogation center in England? He's surrounded by cameras and microphones. There's security everywhere you look, and yet he's been found killed. So you've got your first level of mystery. Who killed him? Why? How was it done? And then his body disappears. And then other people start dying. And gradually people start to wonder, has this dead man got up and started killing other people in the center? What the hell is going on? And this is the second book, Dead Man Walking. Yep, fantastic. Now, the first one, by the way, is called The Dark Side of the Road, and Bain has put that uh, in trade paperback, I believe, also. Um, yeah. Um, the title comes from Bob Dylan. It's from an old Bob Dylan song. He said, if you want to be an outlaw, you have to walk on the dark side of the road. And, of course, Ishmael Dean, the complete outsider, will always be walking on the dark side of the road. Oh, I like that. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Ishmael. Um, great great setup for the story, by the way. That's that's really very uh, 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 well told. Let, let me uh, let's let's rewind a little bit. So um, Ishmael knows he's not human, um, and, and uh, but doesn't know the details. Uh, he also has um, I, I may be going too far to say them super call them superpowers, but he's uh, and he has some unusual abilities, um, right? For example, he doesn't seem to get fatigued. He can he can see fingerprints. Um, what are some of Basically, the other? He is he is human, but he's he's human without any of the normal failings. All his senses are that little bit sharper than ours, yeah. and also he's a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, and that's enough to give him an edge. 
Um, he has no memories of what, who and what he was before he was human, but he does still have dreams and the, and the odd feeling about what, what he might have been. And he has a continuing worry as to exactly... Well, there's this old story you know, of, of, of the philosopher who dreamed he was a butterfly, and when he woke up, wondered, was he really a man dreaming he was a butterfly, or is he a butterfly dreaming he's a man? Ishmael has a continuing worry as to whether he's just the human mask on a sleeping alien. And what would happen if the alien ever woke up and decided it didn't need a human mask anymore? So he, he tries his hardest to be as human as he can. He never wants to be anything else. And for the first time in his life, he's got a human partner. This is Penny Belcourt, whom he met in the first book. And really, she helps. She provides the human insights into the mysteries he's working on, the things that he might miss or might not properly understand. And the two of them together are able to see and deduce things that no one else could. Yeah. Um, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, Ishmael does not carry a gun, interestingly. This is observed by several of the characters around him, right? He goes into this high security facility, and there are people with... Uh, uh, military weapons. Uh, and, uh, something I started on very early that I thought Ishmael would always say a gun limits you. It, 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 that you're always going to think in terms of I got a gun, I'm going to use it. He likes to say I am smarter than the people around me. I will think my way in and out of trouble. And he's fast enough and strong enough that he can act on what he decides very quickly. I like the idea that Ishmael is always going to be that little bit ahead of everybody else so that he doesn't need a weapon to enforce what he does. He's always going to be ahead of not just the enemy, but the people around him. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that there isn't an element of action hero in him. I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's physical action. He's involved in it. Um, well, these but, are murder mysteries. There is a real threat. People, have to be defended. Ishmael is always ready to stand between what he sees as potential victims and potential killers. He sees his job as not just to find out who the bad guy is, but to keep as many people alive as possible. He doesn't always succeed, but he's always in there trying. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, uh, you mentioned that he works for a sort of shadowy organization. He, he actually works for something called the organization, capital O, in, in this novel. That's it. Uh, he has no idea who they are, what they are, what their purpose is. As we go through the series, gradually clues and information starts to emerge. And by the time we get to the end of the 11th or 12th book, we start to get an understanding of what's really going on. But the only contact Ishmael has with the organization is a middleman called the Colonel, who is sort of his superior officer, except Ishmael takes the mickey out of him relentlessly and refuses to be impressed or to acknowledge his authority. He's just, as far as he's concerned, the Colonel is simply there to, to point him in the right direction and tell him what his job is, what the mystery is there to solve is, or who the murderer is that he needs to find. So we've always got that nice clash between the two of them, of the Colonel trying to be the authority figure, and Ishmael absolutely refusing to go along with that. Yeah. And in fact, uh, um, in in book two here, there's a new colonel. There, there's a different. Uh, so colonel is a is a role or a function. Uh, exactly. It, he's the middleman. All that Ishmael knows is the title, the colonel. In the first book, we meet Ishmael and the first colonel, they've been working together for some time. Yeah. And the colonel asks Ishmael to come down to this country house. He says, I'll tell you why when, they, when you get there. And Ishmael turns up to find, the first thing he finds is, the colonel has been murdered. So he doesn't even know what the problem is he's there to solve. Uh, the colonel in the second book is a new colonel. Yeah. He's been brought in to be the new middleman. And this is when Ishmael and, and the colonel, the new colonel, 
meet each other and, and start to get a feel for what their relationship is going to be. And as I say, we've been going for about 11 or 12. I honestly can't remember whether it's 11 or 12 books without checking offhand. <laughs> but they now have a much longer working relationship. And I just would like to say, we're not friends, but we can fake it enough to get by. <laughs> so, um, yeah, interesting. So, so as of book two, Ishmael, Ishmael has, uh, you know, the organization is am, ambiguous enough that he expresses doubts uh, a few times in the book that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm working for the good guy, essentially. Um, I took that particularly because because it was uh, a book about spies and secret agents, you don't really have good guys and bad guys. You simply have sides. Now, I'm a huge fan of the original Ian Fleming, James Bond novels, yeah. which I was reading before I was old enough to get into the cinema and see the movies. Right. The original books were written in the 50s. They were set in the Cold War. They don't have an awful lot in common with the movies. They were much darker. They were much more... Brutal. Um, Ian Fleming always described James Bond as the blunt instrument of foreign policy. He sent him to break things and kill people. That's what he did in the book. And I was really taken with the writing, which is much better than people give him credit for. Fleming was not a pulp writer. He was a good, strong, action suspense writer. If you look at the first book he wrote, the first James Bond novel, Casino Royale, it starts with a wonderful opening set in a casino at 3 o'clock in the morning when everybody's luck has gone bad and you can smell the desperation on the air. And it's a wonderful opening. It sets the mood for the character, the series, everything. Yeah. So I wanted to get, if I was going to do a spy book, I wanted to get back into that ambiguity. Who's the good guy? What, who's on the right side? Who can you trust? And, of course, in the world of the spy, it's a case of who can you trust? Yeah. Well, and Fleming was... Issue... Yeah, sorry? I was just going to say, Fleming was, as I recall, uh, a secret agent in World War II, right? It was with intelligence. Um, yes, can... Ian Fleming was a part of British intelligence in, in World War II. Interestingly enough, um, he said in one of his interviews, I mean, the bad guy in Casino Royale, uh, the Shifra, he said, was actually based on the most evil man he ever met, which was a man called Alastair Crowley, oh, yeah. also known as the Great Beast. And Ian Fleming knew Crowley, because at that point, Crowley worked with him in British intelligence during World War II. Yeah. So I love the fact that these two wonderfully iconic people actually worked together for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. My memory from a book I maybe read 10 years ago, but my memory is that one of the things Fleming did during the war was that he, and boy, I could be getting this wrong, my memory is that he and Roald Dahl were both together part of the uh, British mission to watch the Roosevelt administration. For some time, he was posted in the U.S. during the war to try to make sure uh, that Roosevelt uh, and the U.S. got into the war. My memory could be wrong on that, but I, I read it a, a decade ago. I think ago. what it comes down to is that Fleming himself was never a field agent. He was more like M. He was the yeah. guy behind the desk who sent field agents out to carry out work. But essentially, there were three quite well-known writers. There was Ian Fleming, there was Roald Dahl, and there was Dennis Wheatley, who's now mainly remembered as a horror writer. Yeah. Those three guys were all part of the same department in British intelligence. Oh, interesting. Their job was to come up with weird and unusual ideas, things that were thinking outside the box. And they would then send people out to try them out in the field. Um, they were the ones who came up with all kinds of strange weapons and things you could use for sabotage and so on. And they were all of them involved in, well, in propaganda, in um, basically thinking up new ways to keep the Germans off balance and on the back foot. And reading, I've read several books on the subject, they were quite successful in, in many ways. I mean, you probably know the story of the man who never was, 
when yeah. you go back to, to launch D-Day, they actually found a corpse and dropped it into the ocean with documents attached to him, which persuaded the Germans that they were actually going to um, launch D-Day from a completely different location, which helped to lure a great deal of uh, German military away from the actual landing sites and helped to make it possible for the D-Day invasions to succeed. And Fleming was a part of that. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. So that's, that's, uh, that's sort of all the, the, the background, the intellectual ferment behind this, the organization and, uh, uh, and, and the colonel. What, what, is, uh, um, what does Ishmael think he's doing? Or, or why, why is he willing to work with them when there's sort of uncertainty about their ends? Rich Moore always says, you know, it's getting harder and harder for him to stay under the radar. In our world of increasing surveillance, uh, face recognition patterns, and all this kind of thing, he lives in fear that they're gonna, somebody's going to find out he's not human, and it end up, you know, uh, on a dissection table somewhere, and they try to figure out, you know, who and what he is. So he wo- he's worked for various organizations down the years, and the organization basically stands between him and the rest of the world. They keep him hidden, they protect him, and in return, he agrees to solve mysteries for them. But he's always said there is a line in the sand he will not cross. And he's made it clear to the organization, you know, if you try to get me to do things I do not believe in, I will disappear and you'll never see me again. So both sides are very careful about what they'll ask of each other and what they'll do for each other. But they've been together a while, and as the books go on, I don't think Ishmael ever quite comes to trust the organization, but he does trust that they will only give him the kind of jobs that he is happy to do. Yeah. That's interesting. So, um, so I, I, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, this story uh, started out feeling to me, uh, and the comparison for me was not Ian Plum, but John Le Carre. I said, okay, this is kind of like a George Smiley story. Uh, yes, again, I, another reader that I was, I was hugely fond of. I remember there was a BBC television adaptation of one of his novels, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which was must-see viewing in, in the 70s, and I was fascinated by him. And I went out and read pretty much everything that John Carey had in print, and particularly one book, uh, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, which was about a spy who was being interrogated about what he knew and what he might know about, tra- about traders within MI5. Right. And I flashed back to that when I started plotting Dead My Walking, and I, I just liked the idea of this, this spy who's come in and said, I'll tell you everything you want to know in return for and he's trying to make a deal. But they've got a problem. Is he really the man they think he is? He's had so much plastic surgery down the years that he doesn't look like he used to. And all his old files of uh, fingerprints and so on were destroyed ages ago. So part of the interrogation process is trying to decide out, is this man who he says he is? So you've got layers of mystery, layers of truth and lies going on, as well as the mystery of who is killing who and why. And of yeah. course, when they finally find out who the murderer is, it turns out to be based on the past history of this character. And until you put all the pieces together, you cannot work out the why of what's happening, and without the why, you can't work out who. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a. There's a. It reminded me. So. So the setup was very specifically. Yeah, the spy who came in from the cold. One of the early George Smiley novels. But. But also um, the way that ultimately uh, some some fairly. Um, uh, uh, sort of, so the plot appears to be right. Uh, really, I want to be careful not to give away too much here, but that it's, it's you know it's intelligence, right, and it's interrogation and it's mystery, 
And then there's this, there's these very human elements that kind of cut across that plot, which reminded me of a lot of some of Le Carre's stories too. So I, anyway, well well done, really, is what I'm saying. Yeah. All of the Ishmael Jones books, it's not just uh, a puzzle box, like, say, uh, Miss Marple or a Poirot, where, where they just put things together, the pieces together. It is about the various characters. All my mysteries, all my murders are character-based. And it's about getting inside people's heads and understanding why they're doing what they're doing. And on the other hand, the, the thing that I think is what makes the Ishmael Jones mysteries fascinating is that all the books have what appear to be science fiction or fantasy elements. And some of the time, these are real elements, and sometimes they're not. It just appears to be. I think that gives you an extra, an extra level and an extra edge to what's going on. What makes Dead Man Walking fun is that the Interrogation Center has a long-standing history of being a haunted house. So when things mysterious things start happening, it's, it's adding a layer. Is there a, a supernatural element to what's going on there? So they're constantly second-guessing themselves and second-guessing the evidence, trying to work out what's real, what isn't, or is somebody trying to set up a distraction to make us look in the wrong direction and not look at what's really important? And it gets down to the, at the end of the book. It comes down to who do you trust? Who do you believe? And working out who's lying and why, that's when Ishmael can finally point the finger and say, right, I've got it now. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, there's this running question of, uh, you know, ghosts, are ghosts real? And Ishmael repeatedly uh, expresses the view that ghosts are not real, which is very, it's very interesting, right, in that he's, He's an alien. <laughs> exactly. This is a guy who's an alien saying, oh, no, ghosts. Oh, no, that couldn't possibly be real. Can't be I like the fact that, you know, it's just, you know, oh, no, there's a line in the sand. Just because some weird things are true doesn't right. mean all weird things are true. Yeah. I like the fact that he's the only person in the book who simply refuses to accept the idea that ghosts could be real. There could be a ghost, yeah. Yep. Uh and then there's not this. This is this doesn't connect. This doesn't drive the story at all. But then it, right at the end, he has this sort of momentary uh, uh, vision. Uh, was it a trick? right at the very end? Yeah, it's a nice little bit where he sees something, and uh, I think it's Penny says, "You know, do you believe?" He says, "I'm thinking about it." <laughs> but uh, you know, as the series go on. Um, there are fantasy elements, there are science fiction elements. Sometimes they're real, sometimes they're not. And I think trying to work out what story you're actually in adds to the fun of the mystery. Yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. Well, tell us a little more about Penny then. I, I, I have not read The Dark Side of the Road, but I assume that that manner that uh, Simon shows up at, or sorry, Simon, ah, Ishmael shows up at, <laughs> to... Uh, Understandable. Uh, yeah. Yes, in the first book, um, as I said, you know, the original co calls him down to Belcourt Manor, yeah. and it's the Belcourt family and their guests, and one of them is Penny Belcourt, and he meets her for the first time there, and the two of them fall in love during the run of the novel, and they end up together. And what I like about it is, as the books go on, it's not Sherlock Holmes and Watson. She's not there just to say, tell me what's going on. They are equal partners. She brings not just insight, but intelligence and, um, and indeed action sequences. Um, my favorite television show when I was a kid growing up was the original Avengers TV show with Patrick mm -hmm. McNee and Diana Rigg, as right. John Steele and Mrs. Emma Peel. I loved that, and I loved particularly that they were such equal partners. They weren't the hero and the psychic. They were equals in everything. And through the many series I've written, I've always gone back to that format, that, that each one brings something to the partnership that the other one doesn't. And what I like about Penny is that in many ways, she grounds Ishmael. 
she's the one who, who, who gives the, the more human insight, but she's also the one that says, okay, rein it in a bit. Just because you're an alien, we don't have to go with the weirdest possible ideas here. Let's look at the people, let's look at the relationships. Often she will spot things. You've got um, two characters in Dead Men Walking who are two security guards who are big, strong, XSAS type guys. And Penny is the one who spots that they're gay and in love with each other. Mm. This, smell, yep. this goes right over his head. He, he just it never ended his mind. And until you understand those two, you don't really understand why they're reacting the way they are to what's happening in the story. Once you get that insight, suddenly things start to make sense. Yep. Yep. So, uh, okay, so very good. So so the series, it looks like that um, uh, there are at present 11. So I think you published yeah. 10 with maybe seven books or maybe other publics, like all seven books. So and I've done one new one for Bain, which is Haunted by the Past, which is now out in hardback. Which came out just uh, December, right, just recently. That's right, yes. So... Um, so where does the series go from here? So if a reader picks up and reads the first couple of books um, and, and can read, you know, as Bain puts them out or can go get e-books from seven books conceivably. The whole point uh, of the series is that as we go through, each book is complete in itself. You've got a, a mystery to solve and an ending. But bit by bit, as we progress through the series, Ishmael starts to discover more about his past where he came from, what his background, why his people never came looking for him. Um, for example, I mean, no big spoiler, about midway through the series, he discovers his ship didn't just crash. It was shot down by another alien ship. And for mm -hmm. the first time, he starts to, to wonder, am I the only alien species on this planet? Are there others out there? And as we go through the series, gradually he starts to get more of a feeling for what his background was or might have been and where he's going. And I think it, it, it's fair to say, by the time you're getting to book 10 and book 11, he's got a much better feel of, of himself and what he is and what he wants to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, that, so that's interesting. So that... That raises the question, are you working on a book 12? What happens after 11? Well, I've got a proposal in with Bain at the moment, and I'm waiting to hear what they think. Okay. But okay. It's, I've got an idea for at least another three or four books, which I'd like to do. Um, I'll keep going as long as people are interested and as long as I've got something new and interesting to do with the characters. Fantastic. Um, well, hey, are there any other questions that uh, you think I should have asked or anything else you want to say about Ishmael Jones or about Dead Man Walking? I think we covered most of it. I'll just say, you know, I write these because they're fun. I love Agatha Christie's song, Murder Mysteries. I love uh, the guy who comes in from outside and with his partner and solves what's going on. They're fun. They're action. They're often quite spooky. They're have-a-good-time books. I think there's never enough of those around. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, fantastic. Again, the book is Dead Man Walking, uh, out now in trade paperback from uh, from Bain Books. Uh, Simon Green, thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Good to be here. Good talking to you. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly.
but power brings temptation, and not all the cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a cobra. His great-grandfather was the last of six MacDonald generations to hold commissions in the 51st Highland Division on Earth. Did you know that? Johnny nodded silently. Chris had been curled up on the couch, talking almost non-stop about MacDonald since their arrival back at her home several hours previously. At first, Johnny had been worried, wondering whether she was retreating into some sort of personal fantasy world. But it soon became apparent that it was simply her way of saying goodbye. So he sat quietly in his chair, making verbal responses where necessary, and watched as she purged herself of her grief. The afternoon was nearly gone before she finally fell silent, and for a long time afterwards they sat together in the stillness, looking out the window at the lengthening shadows. What Chris's thoughts were during that time Johnny never found out, but his own were a slowly flowing river of bitterness and unreasoning guilt. Over and over the whole scene replayed itself in his mind, nagging at him with unanswered questions. Had MacDonald really been crazy with rage or thinking perfectly clearly? Had he seen the opportunity to take Sintra and Petrusky out simultaneously and acted accordingly? Had he expected Johnny to back him up in his play? Could the two of them actually have defeated Chalinor's group? The sound of the front door broke the cycle of recrimination and guilt. Dad? Chris called. Yes. Eldjarn came in and sat down next to his daughter. He looked tired. How are you doing? I'm all right. What's happening in town? Not much. Eldjarn rubbed his eyes. Mayor Tyler has basically promised Chalinor none of us will make trouble. I don't know, though. I've heard a lot of rumblings to the effect that someone ought to do something. That someone being me, Johnny said. I gather they think I'm afraid to act. Eldjarn looked up at him, shrugged uncomfortably. No one blames you, he said. In other words, they do, Johnny said, a bit too harshly. Johnny, it's all right, Chris, Johnny told her. He could hardly blame the others. They didn't know why he held back. He wasn't even sure why himself, now. Orin, how many men does Chaloner have in Ariel? Any idea? At least ten cobras that we know of, and probably a dozen of those teenaged arrogants manning roadblocks, Eldiar said. Johnny nodded. Chalinor had said he had twelve cobras on his side. Add Tabor and maybe a couple more, subtract Sintra, and it still looked like nearly all the rebels were now in Ariel. The conclusion was obvious. They're not ready to move against the mines yet. So unready that they'd rather try and box up a whole town than move up their timetable. Any guesses as to why? For a moment the room was silent. The miners usually work a two-week shift and then have a week off in Weald, don't they? Chris asked. Maybe Chalinor wants to move in during the shift change. That sounds reasonable, Johnny agreed. Depending on how the routine goes, Chalinor would hit the mines with either a single shift there or else all three of them. If the former, he has an easier takeover. If the latter, he gets extra hostages, so it makes sense either way. He glanced at his watch. Three days to go if they're on a rational system up there. Should be enough time. For what? Chris asked suspiciously. For me to go upriver to the mines and blow the whistle, of course. And I'd better get started right away. He stood up. Hold it, Johnny. This is crazy, Eldjarn said. In the first place, there are forty kilometers of extremely hostile forest between us and them. In the second place, you'd be missed long before you could get there. Slowly, Johnny sat back down. I hadn't thought of that last, he admitted. You really think Chalinor will keep such close track of me? Eldjarn shrugged. Despite your, um, inactivity this morning, you are still the only person in town who can be a threat to him. Your disappearance would certainly be discovered by morning, and I hate to think what desperate steps he might consider it necessary to take. It's a good idea, but someone else is going to have to do it. Me, for instance. You? Chris looked startled. That's ridiculous. Suicidal, too. Without weapons and with the spine leopards on the move, you wouldn't have a chance. I have to try, her father told her. A boat would protect me from all but the most determined spine leopards. 
and there is a weapon still in town that I can take. What, Seth Ramora's machete? she scoffed. No. Eldyarn paused, and Johnny saw a muscle twitch in his cheek. Ken's anti-armor laser. Chris's jaw dropped. You mean the one in... Dad, you're not serious. I am. He looked at Johnny. Is it possible to remove the laser without amputating the leg? That would be too obvious for Chalinor to miss. It was done once before during our brief foray into civilian life, Johnny said mechanically. All of MacDonald's Cobra gear available, and he'd never once thought about using it. Have you talked to Father Vitkowskis about the funeral arrangements yet? Eldyar nodded. It'll be a combined service for both Ken and Ra Inslee, tomorrow at nine in the square. Most of the town is going to come, I think, and in a crowd that size, Chalinor would never realize I was missing. Johnny stood up. Then we've got to get that laser out now. Ken's body's back there, isn't it? Good. Let's go. As in most frontier towns on Aventine, Eldyarn's job as Ariel's doctor also required him to act as undertaker when necessary, and the modest office surgery attached to the house included a small room in the rear for preparation of the dead for burial. Leaving Chris to stand guard in the office, Johnny and Eldyarn went back there. Laid out on a table, MacDonald's body didn't look any better than it had sprawled in the street, but at least the odor of burned flesh was gone, either dissipated or artificially neutralized. Johnny looked at the chest wound only once, then turned away, concentrating deliberately on the leg. The laser lies right here, beneath most of the calf muscle, he told Eldyarn, tracing the position lightly on MacDonald's leg. There's probably no scar. I haven't got one. But the last time they took it out, the incision line was about here. He indicated it. Eldyarn nodded. I see how they inserted it now. All right. I'll get an instrument tray and we'll get started. The faint sound of footsteps was their only warning. Johnny looked over his shoulder just in time to see the door swing open as Lest and Tabor strode into the room, a white-faced Chris trailing behind them. Good evening, Dr. Eldyarn. Moro, Lest said, giving the room a quick once-over. I trust we're not interrupting anything. We're preparing Mr. MacDonald's body, Eldyarn said shortly. What do you want? Oh, just a little insurance against heroics, Lest glanced over Eldyarn's shoulder. It occurred to me that perhaps we ought to remove our late compatriot's weapons before someone else took it into his head to do so. If you'll just step aside, this will only take a minute. Eldyarn didn't move. No, he said, his tone allowing no argument. I'm not going to permit you to mutilate the dead. You don't have any choice. Move aside. Eldyarn snorted. I realize you're new to this warlord business, but if you think you can kill or imprison a town's only doctor and then expect to get even grudging cooperation from the rest of the populace, you're in for a very rude shock. For the first time, Lest's confidence seemed to waver. Look, doctor. Doctor, would you remove the lasers for us? Tabor put in suddenly. You're a surgeon. You could do it without leaving any marks. Eldyarn hesitated. Johnny, he asked. Johnny shrugged, trying to hide his disappointment at Lest's rotten sense of timing. Either you do it or Lest will. I'd rather you did personally. He impaled Lest with his eyes. But Oren's right. We'll have no mutilation. Specifically, we're not going to let you cut off his fingers. But the lasers, Lest began, no butts. His hands are going to be in plain sight in the casket. Tabor nudged Lest. As long as we can confirm the fingertip lasers are still there in the morning, that should do, he murmured. You can always take them and the power supply out before the actual burial, if you really think it's necessary. Slowly, Lest nodded. All right, but if those fingers are missing in the morning, we'll hold you responsible, doctor. I understand. Johnny, perhaps you and Chris would go over to Ken's house and bring me his cobra dress uniform? Johnny nodded. Bad enough that Chris had had to stand there and listen while MacDonald's body was discussed like a military bargaining chip. There was no need for her to watch as it was cut up as well. Sure. I think both of us could use a walk. Come on, Chris. Just be sure and stay where you're supposed to, Lest warned. The roads out of town are closed, and there are cobras on each barricade. 
Johnny didn't bother to reply. Brushing past them, he took Chris's arm and left. McDonald's house wasn't too far away, but Johnny was in no particular hurry, and the house held a lot of memories for both of them to linger over. By the time they emerged with the carefully folded uniform, it was dark enough for the brightest stars to be visible. Let's walk for a while, he suggested as Chris turned in the direction of home. That's not necessary, she said tiredly. Dad will be finished by now. But it's such a nice night, he said, steering her gently but firmly toward the center of town. She resisted only a moment before falling into step beside him. You have an idea, she whispered. Johnny nodded. I think so. You have the key to your office with you? Yes, but I hadn't gotten very far on my tight beam transmitter. That's okay. Do you have any of those tiny electrical gadgets you can install in a vehicle's control circuits that let you run it by remote control? Radio micro relays? Sure. The miners at Curseage use them all the time for boring machines and slave-controlled ore barges going downriver. She broke off. A boat going upriver? With a message in it? Keep your voice down. The guy following us might hear you. He doubted it, actually. He'd already confirmed that the tale was one of Chalinor's teenagers, who was much too far back to hear anything except the loud scream. But he wasn't at all sure how Chris was going to react to the plan that was slowly gelling in the back of his mind and wanted to put that explanation off as long as possible. They were almost to the edge of the square and within sight of Chris's shop when she suddenly tugged on his arm. There's someone standing at the door, she hissed. Johnny nudged his vision enhancers up. It's Almo Pyre, he identified the guard, with a pellet gun. Chalinor's probably worried about you or Ned putting together something to ungimmick the phone system. Though the fact that Chalinor had apparently deployed the bulk of his forces with an eye to keeping anyone from slipping out of town showed how small a threat he considered Chris's equipment to be, this shouldn't be too hard. What about the tail? Chris asked anxiously. And you're not going to hurt Almo, are you? He's just a boy who's old enough to face the consequences of his choices, Johnny pointed out. Oh, don't worry. I like the kid, too. As for the tail, I think a hard right turn around the drugstore here and a little brisk walking will lose him without tipping him off that we were onto him. Then we'll circle around and come up on your shop from behind. Once we move, there will be no talking, so I need some information right now. As far as Johnny could tell, the trick worked, and they reached Chris's building with Chalinor spy nowhere in sight. The rear of the shop, with no door that required guarding, was deserted. Stepping directly underneath the second-floor window Chris pointed out, Johnny took one final look around him and jumped. His leg servos were more than equal to the task, landing him on the narrow window ledge in a crouched position, knees spread to the sides to avoid breaking the glass, and hands finding good purchase on the wooden frame. The window, open a few centimeters for ventilation, slid all the way up with only token resistance. Seconds later, Johnny was inside. The search was short. All the items he sought were right where Chris had said they were. And within two minutes he was back on the ledge, closing the window behind him. Seconds after that he was walking away from the building as nonchalantly as possible. Chris, at his side, was breathing harder than he was. No problem, he assured her, answering her unasked question. No one will ever know I was there. Let's get back home. You and your father have a lot of work yet to do tonight. Lest and Tabor had long since left by the time they reached the Eldyarn home, but Johnny knew better than to stay inside too long. Fortunately, explaining what he wanted them to do took less than five minutes. Neither Chris nor her father was especially happy with the plan, but with obvious reluctance they agreed. He left immediately afterwards, and as he walked down the street toward his own house, his peripheral vision caught a glimpse of a shadow detaching itself from a bush near the Eldyarn home and falling into step behind him, somewhat closer than before. He sighed, and for the first time since McDonald's death, a tight smile flickered across his face. So the gamble had worked. The tail was back on the job, and the absence of nervous cobras scouring the area indicated the boy had decided that losing his quarry for a few minutes wasn't worth reporting. An understandable reaction, Johnny thought, given the earlier demonstration of cobra killing power. And as far as he was concerned, the kid was welcome to watch him the rest of the night. He just hoped Chalinor hadn't thought to have someone watch the Eldyarns, too. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra. 
And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Simon R. Green and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.